Good afternoon, everyone. And to our distinguished guest, Madam Prime Minister, good morning and welcome. My name is Gretchen Crosby Sims, and I am the executive director here at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. Today, we have the great honor of welcoming Jacinda Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand, for a recording of the Axe Files. Madam Prime Minister, we have watched with admiration as you have deftly navigated your country through a number of crises, including most recently a global pandemic, and taken advantage of a number of leadership opportunities. You've shown us what inspired leadership looks like, and we are so pleased to have the chance to hear from you today. So without further ado, I'll thank you for your willingness to share your time and your insights with our students today and turn things over to David. Thanks, Gretchen. Prime Minister, it's so good uh, to be with you today. We're speaking from halfway uh, across the world, but we share this uh, small planet and a lot of urgent challenges. And I, I wonder if you want to just, if you could just start by talking about those and what the change in leadership in the United States uh, might mean to, uh, to, to, to your thinking on, on meeting those challenges. Well, firstly, can I say, um, kia ora koutou katoa, namahi nui kia koutou. Thank you very much for the opportunity <laughs> to, to be with you um, today. Uh, and you'll see that I'm, I'm obviously on the other side of the world. I'm in Auckland presently, even though I'm throwing you a little bit with my backdrop being a beautiful uh, <laughs> illustration of 1970s style architecture. Um, that's our beehive. And I, I sit just, just uh, a couple of, um, couple of levels from the top that you can see there on, on any given day. And it's a seat that I feel very, very privilege to hold, particularly during these, these troubled times. Uh, you know, I have many, many people who, who frequently choose to point out to me that in the past four years, New Zealand, but indeed the world has had some extraordinary experiences. It actually tracks back to a biosecurity incursion was our first. Uh, we had a horrific terrorist attack, uh, an eruption of um, uh, uh, a volcano in New Zealand called Fakare, White Island, uh, and of course the global pandemic we're all experiencing at present. You know, but one of the, the things that uh, we were discuss, dis discussing, David, before we began um, this session today was despite all of that, New Zealand is, is still a nation that is, that is very, very focused on what's happening globally in the international political environment. Now, in part, I would say that's a little bit cultural. Uh, we're, we're a small nation. We um, consider ourselves to be at a particular place in the peaking order as a nation of 5 million people. Uh, we like to think that we punch above our weight, but we, we never as we assume nothing and we, we, uh, we, we don't act uh, above our station is probably what I, would, what I would say, but we always act on principle and we always act on values. But it does matter to us what's happening in global politics because we inherently know how much that can affect us. In part, I think some of that's borne out by our history. As I've said, we're a trading nation, but we've also been a nation that in the past has been bravely and disproportionately affected by global events. Uh, we lost a significant number of our, uh, of our people um, during, the, during the Great Wars. Uh, we're a nation that uh, during the 1980s took a very strong stance, for instance, on the issue of nuclear testing, because that nuclear testing was occurring in our backyard. We are very clear uh, that regardless of size, that the way we position ourselves is important, and we call on others, regardless of size, to act in the same way. The change of leadership in the United States for us undeniably uh, has created a change in tone. Uh, for issues of global importance, such as climate change, we were incredibly pleased to see that that was one of the first moves that was taken by the Biden administration. One of the reasons that's important to us is that we consider ourselves to be a Pacific nation. And here, it's uh, not just a hypothetical uh, for our neighbours, but a reality. Uh, they are already seeing the impact of rising sea levels and their very existence is being threatened. So that meant a lot to us. In terms of geostrategic issues, you know, I think there's probably a bit of time to play out. Uh, we never assumed, and it has not yet borne out, that there would necessarily be a difference in the positioning between large uh, uh, world uh, powers. The United States and China's relationship, particularly on trade, continues to be uh, tense. Uh, and that's not something we necessarily expected to change, but we are looking for that greater presence 
uh, in some of those areas and regions. And beyond just a strategic uh, approach when it comes to defence uh, issues and growing into being engaged in some of the economic architecture in our region as well. So I'd say that we are, we have, you know, we're looking with caution out to the future, um, but with some optimism as well. You know, you and uh, President Biden uh, are obviously quite different. You, you're the youngest prime minister in uh, New Zealand in uh, 150 years. He is the oldest president we've ever uh, elected. You're a woman, he's a man. And, you know, those things are obvious. But uh, when I look at your agenda in New Zealand, uh, it's really m very much about reversing uh, conservative policies that have been in place for decades and kind of strengthening the social safety net, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the social compact as it relates to, for example, child poverty and as it relates to fair wages and so on. Uh, and that is very much the Biden policy here. And I'm wondering whether you see uh, a sort of new frontier for uh, progressivism uh, uh, in in this presidency here and in uh, politics generally. I mean, do you think we are turning the page uh, on an era in of small government uh, and uh, government sort of absence from some of these issues? Well, I, I think you're right to point out that these approaches are very much the approaches of progressive government. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have options when we enter into a period of, of either social or economic crises, as we are now, you know, many refer to it as a one in 100 year event, uh, one of our more recent reference points, of course, being uh, the global financial crisis, we all have options as to how we respond in, in these times and a conservative agenda uh, would say, um, perhaps traditionally, although we've seen it a little less so on this occasion, uh, that you preserve your, your economic and fiscal position, um, that you uh, pursue austerity measures, um, that you attempt to keep debt levels as low as possible. Uh, and if that means cuts or reductions in services or the entry into more a, a user pay approach, then, then so be it. We took a very, very different view. New Zealand's always been, uh, across different parties, has always been relatively, relative to other countries, relatively conservative on issues of debt. Uh, we, we hold debt levels of about, uh, we had, we had um, of about 20% um, uh, relative to GDP. Uh, but of course, with uh, these circumstances we've experienced, we've, we've lifted um, the, the lid on that in quite a considerable way over a short period of time. We still sit under, uh, are projected to sit under 50% relative to GDP, whereas some countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. are looking closer to 80 to 100%. However, uh, in doing so, our focus has been uh, stimulating the economy, for instance, through welfare uh, payments and transfers. So lifting those on the lowest incomes. And in our minds, that's what uh, we would call two birds with one stone or what Joseph Stiglitz calls double duty. It helps us overcome child poverty whilst also creating stimulus uh, in, um, in the economy. Uh, and the same for climate change. Now is the time to invest in infrastructure that enables our transition. Uh, the same for services. Now is the time to build the hospital infrastructure, the schools, the classrooms, the training institutions. It creates jobs, it invests in our people, and it creates, uh, it resolves some of those long-term challenges. So our response has all been about how do we create that stimulus now but how do we invest in our people now too? So very different to some of the approaches of old. You know, I, I know that you have a, um, a, 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 a challenging, interesting relationship with, uh, with China. The Chinese have, uh, have made the, uh, the argument around the world that democracies are spent, that democracies are, are too lumbering, not agile enough to meet the challenges uh, of this century. And we've seen democracies challenged, not just by that argument, but by all kinds of other forces that have buffeted it. And we've seen the rise of nationalist populist movements and so on. Um, what do you think the state of democracy is? And what, how, do, how do democracies uh, combat 
uh, these forces and uh, push back this that that challenge. That's a very that's a very large question. I'm going to try and break. Well, you're it down. a very big thinker, so I figure I'd throw it at you. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's, you know, I'm, I've sat and observed, you know, politics since I was I was a a, a, a young person. Um, yes. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about these, that. These these my my observation uh, is that people want from their politics, you know. Uh, to see their issues being, uh, if, if, even if they're not immediately resolved. I think people are you know, rational beings. They don't expect politicians to be miracle workers, but they do expect us to see where the issues are, to acknowledge where they exist and to do what we can to respond to them. Now, in times of distress and trial, be they economic, be they social, we as politicians, uh, have two options. Either we take the leap into being very forthright about those challenges and endeavouring to do something about it, or we can take shortcut measures that are all about the short-term gain. Uh, and the short-term gain is very often uh, about taking a route which uh, creates and further entrenches tribalism. So to give you an example, you know, those who would say to the issue of, say, growth and unemployment, uh, a nation that might be struggling uh, with its traditional forms of economic model, where they may have been a manufacturing nation and now suddenly uh, with globalization, they're losing some of their relative positioning there and there's job loss that follows. We have an, an opportunity as politicians to either say, these are the challenges of today that we have to overcome and we have to create and build new systems that invest in our people, that increase productivity, that grow high wage jobs. That is the hard answer. The easy answer is to say, it is someone else's fault and you should be angry about what's happening to you. And so we either choose the model that is hard, but actually delivers some real solutions for people in the long term, or we choose short term divisive politics. And, and across many decades, I've seen time and time again, politicians who would have it within their choice to choose the right road, who choose short term politics. So I do not see democracy at fault. I see various individuals at different times and party politic who have just chosen to do politics in a particular way within a democracy. And it's up to us to make sure that we really equip our people to look beyond that short-term politicking. It's hard. It's really yes. hard, but that's, that's and, how I see the world. And, and maybe harder in a time with social media and yeah. the kind of siloization of information. Um, that, that is a place where uh, demagoguery can uh, really flourish and uh, yes. divisiveness can, can grow. You know, speaking of, of, of China, uh, how do you uh, deal with that, that, that balance? Uh, because uh, you've signed a new trade pact with China. They're your number one trading uh, partner. They're obviously a, a behemoth in your uh, region. Uh, and yet you very strongly uh, uh, are committed to a set of values, human rights. Uh, you've mentioned climate, uh, the you know, rules-based international order. China's been very uh, aggressive in the region militarily and so on. How do you, how do you approach, approach this relationship that is so economically important to you uh, and yet you have so many issues of importance to you, non-economic issues, uh, on which you have deep, deep differences. Mm. You know, we approach it um, with consistency, you know, and that's something that's really important to us. You know, you can search back over a number of years and see that we are nothing if not consistent in our positioning on these issues. Now, our view is that, uh, and I'd say this for any relationship that we have, what we seek is um, a mature relationship, even when we have that complexity, where, yes, we've, been, we've had a strong trade relationship with China for a number of years. Our free trade agreement is, uh, is over 10 years old, you know, and we've recently upgraded that. But in amongst having that trading relationship, uh, we will still speak our mind on human rights issues. We've spoken our mind on the issue of Hong Kong, on the issue of the Uyghur people, and, and we'll continue to do so. And we do that in a, in a 
in a really consistent way. We'll raise it privately, we'll raise it publicly. Nothing we say publicly will ever be a surprise because we have a practice of just conveying these things directly as well because that's in our nature and that's who we are. But, but we will continue to, to straddle both of, these, both of these issues. Yes, there's a trade relationship there, but that will never stop us speaking our mind on issues that are of deep concern to us. I'd say the same about the period of nuclear testing between New Zealand and France. We kept speaking our mind despite it becoming terribly fraught for us for a long period of time. You may have had a few fraught conversations with our own government in the last few years. I'm not sure, but I'm just guessing that there were moments publicly, and we know the public ones privately as well, in which you you expressed your views. You know, you mentioned that you you've been in involved in politics since uh, for a very long time. I'm interested in your story. Uh, your dad was a, a, a lifelong police uh, officer. Uh, your mom uh, was an office manager who, who left that job to raise you and your sister. She was a school uh, cook. And you grew up in a working class community that had many problems uh, and challenges. And I'm wondering how that sort of framed who you are as a leader, what, what propelled you uh, into uh, this notion of public service and politics? So it's hard for any of us to probably determine um, the level of influence different factors have had in our lives. But for me, I, I probably narrow it down to, to a handful. My, my parents' approach to the world, um, most certainly, you're right, my, my mom... Uh, I went to a school of 600 people. My mum ran what we call a school canteen. It's not quite a cafeteria. It's just a place where you buy meat pies and sandwiches. Um, so she was always very present in my life, always always there and always, as you say, made sacrifices so that uh, my sister and I um, had, had someone always there for us. My dad was a policeman for 40 years. He was a detective for a long part of that. Um, but he was... He was never black and white in the way that he saw the world. You know, even in the most horrific cases, I would hear him talk about the context in which some of these things occurred in a way that caused me to think about not just crime as these singular events, but as endpoints to, you know, the environment that we create in the communities that we live in. Uh, and so they definitely influenced the way I see the world. But I was also raised Mormon. Um, which uh, is is a bit unusual in in uh, in my country. It's not a it's not a large religion here, but I think that absolutely. Although um, I don't consider myself of that faith anymore, I in, in heritage terms, I there's a lot that I took from that that they are very service orientated church, and so that definitely influenced me as well. But when I was very young. I have these memories of that period where I lived in um, a small town called Murupara, about 3,000 people. It was a town that was predominantly based around the forestry industry. And when I lived there, there was significant change and a lot of job loss. Uh, and I remember the poverty that existed there. A hugely resilient town, wonderful people, but, uh, you know, just, you know, heartbreaking poverty. But I was just a child. And so there was, there was, nothing about that that seemed fair to me because when you look at the world through the lens of a child uh, it doesn't make sense why I had shoes and another child didn't or I had a school lunch and another child didn't and so I think probably from quite a young age I was motivated by issues of inequality um, it took me a long time to decide that politics was the place to do something about that so I can assure you I wasn't aspiring to be a politician age five <laughs> Although we should point out that your uh, your classmates voted you the most likely to become prime minister when you graduated from what we would call high school. Oh, so... I have an explanation for that. I mean, the town <laughs> I was living in at that time was very conservative. Like, well, you know, that's probably unfair. A conservative town, an agricultural town, is predominantly centered around the um, around dairy farming. And uh, I was, here I was, the liberal progressive kid, the only one anyone knew that belonged to a political party. So I was destined to be labeled the politician. Yeah, and you, uh, your aunt was involved in labor politics and she got you involved as a teenager. You, uh, you worked for a member of parliament uh, uh, as, a, as a young person. You went, uh, th I, this is sort of extraordinary. You ended up, 
after a at graduating from college, brief stay in New York, six months in New York, working in a soup kitchen. And so he ended up in London working yeah. on Tony Blair's staff uh, when he was prime minister. Um, what did you learn uh, there that has been useful to you uh, as prime minister? Well, I should, I should, in fairness, add that the cabinet office is a very large place uh, in the UK. So yes, um, I was- Understood. In the I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you were sitting at his right hand. Oh, but, uh... in New Zealand, because we're so small, people think that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know, I learned one of the most immediate lessons, because here I had come out of New Zealand politics. I'd worked in this building behind me as a 20-something-year-old where there was close proximity to the politicians you're working for just by virtue of our size. And suddenly I went into this big machine of, uh, uh, of a civil service uh, where the idea of contact time with a minister was very rare, um, but the bureaucracy around doing anything was incredibly intense. I remember spending an entire morning on one occasion trying to organize a conversation between two ministers that needed to occur. Uh, in New Zealand, you would just ask your minister to walk across the hallway and talk to someone. Um, the, the cabinet meetings, uh, often we would be able to anticipate quite clearly uh, what would occur in cabinet committee meetings in a way that was much more organic in New Zealand. So I came to appreciate our proximity. I came to appreciate the uh, accessibility that we have to those who are decision makers and the ability we have to move the dial quite quickly. Now, that is a useful thing, um, given we have three-year terms, uh, but it, in New Zealand, we think that everything is very, very slow and cumbersome, but relative to other countries, um, much, much quicker. And the second, the second thing for me was just by virtue of the unit I was in, I was in something called the Besha Regulation Executive. And if I ever yes. wanted to shut down a conversation, I would just say which unit I worked in. Uh, uh, it, it I, was gonna, I was actually going to ask you about that because you were the assistant director of the Better Regulation Executive, and I'm thinking, well, you must have an awfully large business card to get <laughs> uh, to get that title down. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was. It, let's just say um, I, I remember coming home um, one day and getting off the bus, and and the person who lived next to me was sitting on our stoop, and he, we were having a conversation. And he said, "What do you do?" And I said, oh, "I work for the cabinet office." And he said, oh, what kind of cabinets do you make? <laughs> and I thought rather than explain to my work for the Better Regulation Executive, I just said to him, oh, dining and occasional. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was in that role, my job was to try and improve really the relationship between business and government. And so I thought a lot about, you know, the fact that when we're presented with a problem as government, we use the levers we have, and the levers we have are often cumbersome. They're often regulatory, they're legislative, uh, and they, as a result, can be quite a blanket approach to sometimes what are very nuanced issues. So during that period, I became much more open-minded about exploring different tools, different ways of doing things. And uh, I, there is no question in my mind, I draw on that experience a lot. The Christchurch call, uh, is an example of that. And I imagine we might have a chance to touch on that. But that, in my view, was that regulation, yes, can be part of the answer. But so often we need to work collaboratively together as civil society, as government, as business to create much more responsive uh, resolutions to issues. And, and I took that as a direct, direct uh, um, lesson from my time in the UK. Yeah, you, you went home. Uh, and uh, at the age of 28, you were uh, elected um, uh, to your parliament. You were the youngest member uh, of parliament. Uh, and nine years later, uh, your party uh, was in trouble two months be before an election. And uh, they, uh, they called on you uh, to lead. I read somewhere that you turned the opportunity down about seven times before you accepted. Is that true? Uh, I turned down the opportunity to become an MP. Uh, so I was I was living in London when I got a call from one of my um, my old bosses. He had been a minister that I'd worked for, and he said, "Look, why don't you come home and run for Parliament? We need some young people." Uh, I said no. I said no, and and a couple of reasons. One, you know, I was in the middle of my what we call 
an OE, you know, my overseas experience. We yes. do it so often in New Zealand, it has an acronym. <laughs> uh, and the other reason was because I didn't know that I was tough enough for politics. Uh, I had it in my head, um, for good reason, that you have to be quite thick skinned. You certainly can't be the emotional type. Uh, and I didn't know whether or not, having had such close proximity to the place and having seen it in action, whether or not I, I could do it. So I said, um, I said no. Uh, and it was only after someone convinced me that I could run from London, because New Zealanders who live overseas can vote in our elections, that I could run from London uh, on the party list. We have an MMP style system that I convinced myself that I could do that. I could contribute in that way without being elected. Um, but then I was elected. So, I so this wasn't when you were, when they came to you about uh, when the, the, the leader was going to step down, wanted you to take over. Uh, you had no reluctance then. Oh, oh, well, and actually on that occasion, the first person who suggested to me that I needed to take over was the existing leader. Yes. His, his name was Andrew Little. Yes. And he, he sat me down after we received a, a poll in uh, late July that suggested, and the election was due in September, that suggested we weren't going to win. And he said to me, I think you need to do it. And I, I said, absolutely not. <laughs> Uh, absolutely not. You need to stick it out, and I'll be right there with you. But in the end, he resigned anyway. Did you so, did you say absolutely not because you knew you thought the party was going to get badly beaten, or did you say no because you were afraid I you thought, were going to win? <laughs> well, oh no, I told him he needed to stick it out because I thought we would be punished by voters for changing course so close to an election. You know, mm -hmm. I thought that there was a chance that they would say, well. You know we're you know we're eight weeks out from an election and you've just changed the leader we're not we're not willing to vote for you so i thought there was a risk there and that we would be better off having the stability of his leadership which we'd had over three years so that was part of it part of it was also just whether or not i thought uh that uh, i was right to do it at that time as well i mean so and yeah, i was loyal as well you uh so you're 37 years old you you come back spectacularly in those two months a lot because of you in the sense that there was youth and energy and a new leader uh and now you're i don't know if this expression translates but now you're the dog that caught the car uh you're <laughs> actually in charge um and and how what was what was your sense then when you a dog woke that up catches the next morning the car and ever really in charge <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's, a, that's the right phrase. I think the answer, the yeah, the answer is no. But I didn't ask whether you were the dog that caught the car. I asked whether you felt like the dog who caught the car. Do you? Uh, I mean, was there a sense of um, of uh, holy smokes? What what now? Or was it? This is a great opportunity. I'm ready to go. I have no doubts. Um, so, well, I'd say much more the second than the first. In part because, of course, you know. Even in constructing your campaign, you're constructing your agenda. You're out spending weeks talking to people about what it is you want to do in those that first period of time and across three years. And so we had, for instance, in a hundred day plan, the things that we wanted to do as soon as we as we got in. The thing that's different about New Zealand system as well uh, is that it wasn't a matter of uh, us having an election night and we were declared the winner. Um, we have an MMP system, much like um, Germany's system, uh, where uh, sometimes an election uh, night doesn't deliver a result. And that was the case for us. Yes. Uh, they were, they well, were let, let me parties. tell you, Prime Minister, that we've, uh, we've dabbled in that ourselves recently. Ah. So. <laughs> so, so you know what I'm, you know, of course, what I'm referring to. Yes. Uh, and so that meant that we had a period of time where election, uh, post election, where negotiations needed to take place. So the question at that point was, you know, would we be the, you know, would we be the major party in a position to form government or would um, the incumbent, mm -hmm. uh, as it turns out, um, uh, the leader of this the small party who held the balance of power uh, stood up on a podium one day after a couple of weeks of of negotiation and declared that he would work with us. Yeah, which so was, was kind of, which was kind of, was sort of unprecedented, kind of an extraordinary development. That was really your first leadership test. But you know, you say you ran on an agenda 
And yep. so you felt comfortable with that, but you've learned. But also because of the, the way that the, we formed government, the immediate act, as soon as that night when he made that decision, it was straight into formalizing the coalition agreements, working through negotiations on what we would, what we would be implementing. It, there was just no time to sit and think what just happened. But my, but my question was, um, you know, and I learned this in my own experience, so working uh, in the White House, you set an agenda out and, you, and your expectation is to pursue that agenda. And then events intrude, volcanoes yes. intrude. Uh, and you mentioned Christchurch, this horrific, horrific massacre uh, uh, at two uh, Muslim mo mosques in, uh, uh, in Christchurch happened, 51 people uh, killed uh, by a uh, extremist uh, terrorist gunman. Uh, tell me about that ex experience and the steps that you took, because, you know, we're dealing with these issues all the time here of mass uh, murders with guns. Uh, it's a constant, uh, it's a constant heartache for us and frustration. Uh, so tell me what you did and tell me how it's worked. You're, you're right to say that, uh, you know, the things that you campaign on are the things that you hope to do while you're governing. And if I've learned anything, it's that um, particularly through the pandemic, and I'll come, I'll come back to the terrorist attack, but particularly through the pandemic, the better you're able to manage the things that you don't anticipate, the more mm -hmm. likely you are to be in the position to do the things that you that you. I think that's do. right. I think yeah. that's right. Those are the tests that, that where people are intensely focused on you and make judgments Absolutely. about you. Absolutely. And so those things either um, uh, either wind up being the, the reason you are unable to fulfill your own agenda, or they become the things that you do alongside it. Um, the terrorist attack on uh, in March, um, uh, several years ago now, or two, uh, was was just devastating for us. You know, as a nation, we had not experienced anything like that before uh, and that's not to say we were naive to it but it, it is to say that it was incredibly jarring for us as a as a country um, uh, and the response that you saw was very much a New Zealand response you know that was you know our no matter where you lived in the country people just flocked um, to um, mosques uh, in their community, Islamic centers in their community, just as a way to try and give a sense of solidarity. I felt like uh, at any given time, um, my job was just to reflect how New Zealanders were feeling. Uh, and alongside a huge amount of grief, set a real determination that if there was anything in the way that our laws existed or um, the way our regular tool, regulatory tools work that may have created an environment that, that enabled this to happen, then that needed to be dealt with immediately. And I, I remember sitting in a meeting where the police described to me the terrorists' firearms and how he had accessed those firearms and used them that day. And, uh, despite knowing that if I wanted to create any changes, I would need the support of three parties. Uh, I felt so strongly about needing to change those rules that I just that day went down and said we would. And roughly 10 days later, we did. And you basically, you ban the, the sale uh, of uh, semi-automatic weapons yes. in your country. How effective has that been? And what was, what was the reaction? Well, the interesting thing for us is that actually, in terms of effectiveness, it was very difficult for us to gauge uh, how many of these military style semi automatic weapons existed in the community because we license users, we don't register individual weapons. And that's been that's part of the issue we've identified and sought to address. But we wanted to create as much support for this move as we could. And so our view was, look, people have gone out and they've legitimately bought these weapons when it's been legal to do so. We are now banning their use. We essentially need to buy them back. And so that's what we did. We bought in independent assessors to help us create a guide 
for the different weapons that we were um, buying. And we set up stations and, uh, and collection points around the country and we bought them. Uh, and that was our way of trying to create an environment where people saw that we were being fair in the way we were doing what we were doing. And by and large, it had really good support. Now, there's some legitimate use for those weapons in New Zealand, peace control. We've got a lot of wild goats, deer and possums in New Zealand. So we created a mechanism to deal with that. And I think people saw we were pragmatic. So it had fairly broad support. Uh, there were some lobbyists in the United States who weren't so happy to see what we were doing in New Zealand. So we probably got a bit of noise from that. Yeah, and Australia went through a same, the same kind of thing some years ago. So uh, these are models. We have a much more difficult situation here because of um, uh, obviously the constitutional issues, uh, but also the pervasiveness of, of guns is so great here. But it's an interesting, you, you created an interesting template and uh, one uh, that, that worth uh, thinking about here. Um, what about the pandemic? You've been, you've been held up as a sort of model globally uh, for how you handled it. You handled it in a very, very uh, uh, swift and uh, I don't want to say draconian, but a very, you know, very, uh, so those who didn't like it may have said draconian, but, as, but, a, but a very emphatic way in that you uh, imposed a lockdown very, very quickly. Um, and you've experienced very uh, few cases of the virus, a couple of thousand cases in a country of five a million. Uh, tell me about that and the decision making around that and the challenges around that. You know, uh, one of the advantages that we had, and I'm always quick to point to these advantages because, uh, you know, for, for us, our decision making was enabled or supported by the evidence and uh, we were able to draw on and what we were seeing in other places that were gravely affected early on in the pandemic. Um, so, uh, you know, there was that, that played a big role for us. Our first case didn't arrive in New Zealand until the 28th of February. Uh, uh, by this time, we'd seen um, just the scale of it. So we're starting to see the scale of its impact. We'd already started using our borders as a way to control uh, the, the entry of the virus into New Zealand. And, you know, as an island nation um, that takes quite a bit of effort and energy to get to, that was, that was really critical for us. One of the challenges we had though, of course, was that we have a large number of New Zealanders who live abroad and many of them started coming home. And so that, that really did expedite um, uh, and increase the numbers that we were seeing in New Zealand. But for me, the, the decision-making process went a little bit like this. Early on, everyone was talking about flattening the curve. And flattening the curve, of course, was all about trying to keep level of infections at a rate where you were able to cope within your health system with what was coming through the doors. If your health system's overrun, people unnecessarily die. That felt to us like a very tricky um, level to try and maintain for a virus that was moving through the community at such a, at such a rate. I remember one day, uh, I have a chief science advisor and my chief science advisor, we were in daily contact and she came into the building and she, she put down in front of me a graph that some epidemiologist had crafted, which showed that flattening the curve in New Zealand wasn't going to work. The rate of infection would outstrip our hospital capacity and people would die. And we talked about then what the alternative was. And the alternative was this model of these small waves, which the easiest way to express it was, we see the virus prop up, we use control measures and infection control measures and contact tracing and isolation to try and just get rid of it every time it arrives. And I was looking at this graph saying, well, okay, we've got to find a way to communicate to people that we will have to move in and out of restrictions depending on what's come, what we're experiencing. Now, communicating that kind of system, I, the only thing I could liken it to is in New Zealand when we are in drought conditions, you know, we have these little gauges that sit on the side of the road for fire as well. I think I've seen them in the United States yes. where people know they're either in green or they're in red or they're in, they're in yellow. So uh, we said, look, we need an alert system. 
and we need a set of measures that depending on the risks sit alongside and we need to share with New Zealand that that's what we're going to do. And so we had that conversation on a Wednesday. By a Friday, we were sitting down designing the alert level system by Saturday. We did something extraordinary. We don't do live broadcasts that cut into programming in New Zealand, but we did that on that day. And it was the middle of the day. So people told me afterwards, they saw people stop in the supermarket and watch on their phones. I, I literally felt like we were preparing New Zealanders for war. Um, it felt, the magnitude of it felt really significant. Uh, by a couple of days later, we were in a, a full lockdown. But in doing so, we managed to get control back. We managed to get control back and develop a system which has meant that we have managed this little, you know, stamp it out strategy, which has enabled us to eliminate COVID-19. So here in New Zealand right now, uh, we're at a, an alert level that means you can move around freely. We ask you to scan wherever you're going so that we have a list of where you are in case we need to contact trace you. But people are only wearing masks on buses and planes. There's no social distancing. We have large scale gatherings. Life is normal, except you can't fly anywhere without going into quarantine. <laughs> so um, that's our existence right now. But it has worked for us and it saved people's lives. Um, yeah, and it has, and, and it has gotten the uh, attention of the world. And I want to talk about that. You govern a country that is uh, smaller than Cook County, which is where the University of Chicago uh, sits. Unless you, well, and, Cook and, County and, sounds lovely. <laughs> unless, but uh, nobody, but the world doesn't know who the president of the Cook County Board is. The whole world knows who the Prime Minister of New Zealand is. This uh, Jacinda Mania. I'm sure thing. that's not true. It's just send a mania thing is is a real thing. And um, I'm wondering how you process all of that. Uh, you know, you're 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 everybody knows your your partner. Everybody knows you had a child uh, while you were uh, in office there. There's just this tremendous fascination uh, with you. And does that is that does it feel weird? <laughs> to be in that oh, position. I mean, it's, as you're talking about it, I feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> but, but in part, that's probably because, again, it, it's, um, that's that's uh, our New Zealand way. We um, uh, we're not very good at taking compliments, or um, we, we we never like to be uh, we never like to be put on a, a a pedestal. If I could, it's very hard for me to explain. It makes us feel deeply uncomfortable. We're kind of quite a we're not a we're not a country that does hierarchy particularly, um, and so uh, it's not a it's not a big deal when people will see me at the supermarket or out and about normally. So to hear you talk like that is is strange for me. But I, I think you know Clark and I and Neve, we we actually behind the scenes have a very normal life. Um, behind the scenes, it just so happens that it's a little bit of a struggle for us to spend too much time together. But by and large, we still try and be as normal as we can. Uh, so that's why it feels feels odd. Is all that attention, is it helpful or hurtful politically? Do New Zealanders take pride in the fact that their leader is 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 globally known and, and widely respected? Or, or, or is it like, hey, she's spending too much time on that stuff. She should be focused on us. Well, I, I don't think anyone thinks I'm not focused on New Zealand. I haven't been anywhere for, for, for 15 months. Um, so I'm right. That right helps, here. yeah. That helps. I don't, I don't do a, a lot of international um, uh, media and things. I try and really, because actually for me, it's very genuine. I'm elected to be the prime minister of New Zealand. I'm interested in doing the inter in international work where it, it does further, you know, some of the, uh, the issues that we care deeply about, um, human rights on, on the world stage, those multilateral institutions, our trade agenda, climate action, you know, where, where we have a role to play, that's where I'll look to try and play it. But as, as for, you know, New Zealand on the world stage, I think we probably, we, we don't spend too much time thinking about it, I don't think. Um, the odd article might crop up here and there, but beyond that, I, I don't think it really is, is top or, or front of our mind. You're not the first woman to serve as prime minister. You're the third woman to serve as prime minister uh, of New Zealand. Um, but surely you have faced sexism in, 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 in politics and, and some barriers 
uh, and there are probably women who are listening to our conversation today who uh well i aspire, hope so otherwise there's just 157 blokes on here <laughs> aspire, who aspire to who aspire to leadership and, and what advice do you have for them based on your experience you know i think when I think about the experience of women in politics in New Zealand over the years, they've, they've, they've been vastly different. Uh, you know, I'm the 99th female politician to have entered into New Zealand politics, but the number since me has, has escalated rapidly, and that is fantastic. But it was not so long ago that being a woman in politics was a very isolating experience. And so it's very easy to look back on that period and go, well, at least I don't get the constant commentary on clothing or the blatant sexism that you used to see. We have moved a long way. But I don't think, therefore, um, a woman of my generation or women seeking to move into leadership, therefore, can trivialize their own experiences, which I think we have a tendency to do sometimes. The biggest barrier for, for me was probably the fact that I didn't necessarily think that the traits that I held and valued the most were those that would be easily accepted in politics. You know, I talked a little bit about feeling like I wasn't really tough enough for the environment of politics. Well, that assumes that all political leaders need to be really thick skinned, that it's not okay to be, uh, um, you know, a sensitive person in politics, that you can't wear your heart on your sleeve, or that if you outwardly display your compassion or empathy, that somehow you, you can't be a successful politician. You know, whether or not you call that a gendered issue, whatever label you put on it, it, it is a barrier. If you can't see yourself, and your style of leadership or the traits that you value in the places that you're seeking to be, then you won't naturally think there's a place for you or there's a place for you to be successful. And at that point, you've either got two options. You either hang back, as I was inclined to do, and say, that's not the place for me. Or once you're in there, you struggle or you seek to change yourself. And my, my advice would be, do not change yourself. <laughs> Do not think to succeed that you have to then fit the mold of what you see around you, because in doing so, we're not creating a space for others. Someone eventually has to say, actually, it can be different. And you can be a different form or style of leader. And there is a place for you when you do that. And perhaps in doing so, you might better reflect a whole other part of society that hasn't felt reflected or seen in that place or in that workplace or in that form of leadership. So that would be my advice, be you. Yeah. Even if you can't see yourself there, someone has to break that mold. And I would argue that uh, empathy is, a, is a, a hugely important quality of leadership and authenticity is an absolutely essential quality in uh, if you're gonna be a successful uh, candidate for high office. So, uh, you know, th those, and, and you've proven that. Uh, before, uh, uh, before we close here, I, I wanted to, I, I read a quote of yours about remembering, uh, uh, recalling Tony Blair's last speech in the parliament uh, when he was uh, at the end of his, his leadership. And you, said, and you said, I still remember that moment. You can have that enormous career in politics, that, uh, that period, and then suddenly, poof, that's that. It's done and you're gone. Uh, you're so young, uh, but you are at the peak of, of that moment now. Uh, do you think about uh, the fact that there'll be a moment when it will be done? And do you think about what your next chapters might be? I have no idea. <laughs> I've never had a plan. I've never had a plan. Um, and in some ways, you know, that's enabled me to eventually come to the point where I'll just take up the next challenge that comes my way. So that's always worked out for me. Um, and I feel like if I was thinking about doing anything other than what I'm doing now, I wouldn't be focused enough on, on the here and now, which is where I need to be. So no, I, I have no idea. Um, I'll, probably, I'll probably just go and be a, a slightly more present mum <laughs> or something like that. But I, I do think about the, the moment, whenever it is that I'm no longer doing this. And I think about it because I sit in parliament from time to time when people do their valedictory. So in New Zealand, when you finish your, your time, you have a chance to give a speech and say goodbye in the same way I watched Tony Blair. 
And we also have this really, um, this really interesting tradition that when a member of parliament passes away, no matter what they've, you know, they might have left 20 years ago, but when they pass away, we stand and we have a minute's silence. And that happened a number of times when I first became an MP until one day I stood in a moment's silence for a name I did not recognize. And that's when it really hit home for me that, you know, all of us, we're there for these moments in time and it's a really privileged place to be. And someday someone will not recognize your name anymore, but they might be someone who went through university because we made that first year for them to do that for free. They might be someone who lived in, in a safe, warm, dry state house because we built one. Uh, or they might be someone who, you know, lives in an area that wasn't inundated um, by water because of what we did on climate action. It, it doesn't matter if people don't remember your name, but it does matter if you did something meaningful while you were there. And so that for me is the most Im important thing. Well, let me say as the director of the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago, I, I, I could not embrace what you just said more about what the meaning of politics and public service truly is and how you measure your worth and how you measure uh, success. So I, I appreciate that. And speaking of which, we have some questions from students. Um, and the first one will come from Claire, who is a student in the uh, college. And am I, uh, am I reading this uh, question? I guess I am. In oh, look, there's Claire. Oh, is she here? Oh, Claire, go ahead. Thank Are you. you here? Yes. Okay, um, great. Thank you for taking my question. Um, in 2019, New Zealand announced a new economic approach, a well-being economic budget that was intended to more holistically meet the needs of your constituents. 2020, however, was by no means a year to regular year to see the impact of that budget. So despite that, how have you seen that the new budget has affected the lives of New Zealanders and how has it affected your policy throughout the year? A good question. Claire, on the basis of that well-being budget, uh, we made the largest investment in New Zealand's history in mental health. Um, because by taking that well-being approach, you know, you, you immediately see the positive effect of investment on um, people's well-being. Uh, it affects their lives, their livelihoods, their workplaces. Uh, that package, though, we were very honest from the outset with such underinvestment, um, uh, we needed to build the workforce. So probably one of the things that has been the hardest off the back of the well-being budget is just the time it takes for us to then see the positive effects and how difficult it can be often to measure outcome in some of those areas. So uh, the positive effects, we know now that we're building a primary mental health care system. Um, uh, we've got over a million people who are now covered by doctors where you not only can see your doctor, but you can be brought in and get um, cognitive behavioral therapy training in the same place. Uh, and so that will create a difference, but measuring the impacts of well-being often much more difficult, but we don't want to default to this idea that GDP is still the only and most important measure uh, in a country's success. So over time, I hope that we will build tools that enable us to demonstrate the impacts of our well-being budgets. Claire, thank you. Burke, uh, another student in the college, please. Um, yes, Step up. thank you so much, Prime Minister, for coming. Um, my question is, well, many people claim that more quote unquote progressive policies and positions that countries like New Zealand are adopting are unique to their political and social environments um, and that they simply wouldn't work in a country like the United States as an example. Um, and I want to see, you know, how, how would you respond to these claims and to what extent do you think that they are true? Oh, do you know, I mean, I can, I can only, I can only, you know, of course, I don't have the experience of being a member of the civil service in any other, um, in, in the United States. Of course, I've got that experience in the United Kingdom. Um, but as an observer of, of politics and political systems, uh, I think the only barrier sometimes is just what your citizenry is used to. That actually we have it within our power to shift and make cons considerably different decisions that we have in the past. We just have to find ways to bring our citizenry with us. I remember watching the debate around uh, universal healthcare in the United States. And I could not understand how this became ideological 
for, for me, if there's anything you should be able to take politics out of, it's whether or not you should be able to access care when you're sick. Um, what, why is there politics in that? <laughs> uh, and so uh, you'll, look, you'll listen to me saying that and think, ah, oh, how naive. But that's, that's literally how I view the world. You know, uh, yes, you can have some debate in New Zealand about whether or not how much you should pay the, G, the doctor or so on. But actually, by and large, we across the board accept that there are some things that actually aren't about politics. They're just about access, decent human rights, and making sure that you're looking after your people so you just got to bring your citizenry with you. And, and, and if there's an ability to try and build a cross-party approach, try and take it. That's when something sticks. My last point, we just made the biggest increases to benefits in New Zealand, our government support system in New Zealand since the 1940s, and the opposition didn't disagree with it. So it is possible to bring people with you. Thanks, Burke. Uh, Maggie, uh, a student in the college, step up. Hi, uh, kia ora. Um, oh, kia ora. Yeah. Um, I did my working holiday in New Zealand before starting as an undergraduate um, at UChicago. So, and I loved it. So thank you so much. Um, oh, but wonderful. One of the most common conversations I found myself having with New Zealanders um, was surrounded immigration and um, the worry that New Zealand's urban infrastructure couldn't really handle the growing population. And so I, you know, the growing multiculturalism in New Zealand is incredible, but um, I was just curious about your response to the complaint that the grand majority of monetary resources and government support um, is being allocated to, I don't know, Auckland, for example, or, and perhaps leaving other New Zealanders underserved. And, and I guess along the same lines, do you think it'll be necessary to promote more regional development in the future? Yeah. Namahi nui ki Thank you, Maggie, um, for your question. I hope you enjoyed your time here and that you tell everyone uh, what an amazing place it is to visit when you can. Uh, so we have had that, that issue of just growing um, population pressure uh, in New Zealand's largest city. We have a housing crisis, so it is having an impact. People aren't able to access affordable housing in New Zealand present. And whilst we're pulling every lever we can to try and change that, there's no question that some of it has been around um, the, the way that we've accessed a temporary workforce for New Zealand. And it's, it's not always been that way over the last 10 years. So before we took office, um, we saw temporary, temporary work visas um, in New Zealand double from 100,000 to 200,000 when you're a small country that has an impact. In fact, in the OECD, we have the largest portion of temporary workers in the OECD. So that's not something people necessarily will know about New Zealand. Now that has an effect on infrastructure, as you say, but also it can have the effect of suppressing wages. It can have the effect of decreasing productivity, uh, using um, technological tools to change up the way that we do things. Uh, um, so uh, we've been encouraged um, by uh, the likes of the OECD to think a little bit about the, the settings that we use and also training and education. Now we're doing that but I've said to New Zealanders, we need to have a discussion about when our borders open again, whether or not those who are coming to work in New Zealand are having a good experience, whether they're getting decent wages and a decent place to live, or whether or not we need to do things differently. So that's a debate that we're having right now. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, John, who uh, is a, a fellow countryman, uh, Prime Minister, has a question for you that's related. Yeah, kia ora, Ms. Arden. Uh, my name is John. I graduated kia ora, from college. John. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm now at Chicago Booth. Um, and yeah, I just want to first ask you, uh, I, I want to first just say thank you for, uh, for this talk. Um, and, and second, um, I wanted to also mention that I also come from a, you know, a conservative and agricultural town in New Zealand, being Gisborne. Which one? Gisborne. Um, oh. Which I know you have some connection to, so. I love um, Gisborne. At least you had the C. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I was surfing. Um, but no, yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask how you imagine um, the economics and like the, uh, the industry dynamics of these sort of um, smaller towns changing um, over time, especially how, you know, trade has changed a lot um, over the past few decades and a lot of different trends have, have emerged. Yeah. So, yeah. John, when did you, when did you, where were you last in Gisborne? Uh, it's, it's been about three years. Okay. Um, this is so. Time. 
So one of the things that we did when we came into office, I mean, um, John's talking about a, a place in the east coast of New Zealand that has has had experienced high levels of unemployment, high levels of um, socioeconomic deprivation. Uh, when we came into office, actually one of the points that was made by the previous questioner was that there had been a lot of investment or at least perceived investment in our larger cities. And there had been underinvestment in those rural and provincial regions. So we created a billion dollar fund that was all about provincial growth and development um, and job creation. And we have been so lucky that our timing has been right for this piece of work because it's been right at the time where we've potentially lost jobs. Gisborne was one of the early hardest hit regions with COVID because it's a forestry um, town. And so when China uh, was unable to take our exports for a period just because of their COVID response, uh, we immediately went in to try and redeploy people into alternative work. The provincial growth investment has meant, for instance, um, there's one of the surf clubs, John, in Gisborne Midway is being um, rebuilt. The Gisborne Pools um, is being redeveloped. Um, we have a number of different investments down there which are creating jobs. Uh, and we now have a housing issue in Gisborne. Uh, there's not enough development going on and house prices are going up exponentially because we're bringing growth back to the area. So this has been part of our strategy, leave no town behind. Um, and it is making a difference, but it's causing us other problems in other ways. So I'll be really interested when you come home, John, to see what you think. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, John. We've We've spared everyone right now because John and I, if we went into a conversation for just two <laughs> more minutes, we would identify someone that we both know. <laughs> I wish we had time to play that. Uh, but uh, we have one more question. It's always a you, fun you, game you, to watch a Kiwi play. <laughs> you've got a country to run. So Kira, uh, a student at Booth, um, our uh, business school, uh, has the final question. Oh, thank you. It's so, I'm so, so honored to be talking to you right now, but you spoke a little bit earlier about the importance of authenticity and sort of kindness in your work. I'm interested to hear you talk more about your leadership style, especially when your work and the decisions that you make and the sort of words that you speak affect so many people. I think that probably one of the, the key things, so is never to be overwhelmed in a decision is to try is to try and think about the, the, the issue and the decision at hand, you know, scale. If you, I think if you sat and thought too long about the idea that in, within a 24 hour period, you, for instance, have to decide whether you're going to lock down every member of your country. If you spend too much time thinking about the magnitude, it can be overwhelming. So in those decision-making moments, very much it was coming back to just what the evidence told us, what, you know, what the, what at the core of the issue we were trying to deal with, and then you just dealt with the consequences that sat around it. Uh, so that was just a way to kind of keep everything, uh, to just stop anyone from being overwhelmed when we were trying to make those decisions. The next most important point for me is that one of the benefits of coming in to be leader in such a short space of time was I had no choice but to be myself. There was no time to sit down and have anyone tell me how I needed to reinvent who, reinvent who I was, or that I, needed to take a particular agenda that wasn't my own through a campaign. Uh, it was so immediate. Uh, I, the, I arrived in Parliament one morning, Andrew Little resigned. By that afternoon, I was the leader and I gave us 72 hours to reshape our entire election campaign. So I've in a way been lucky. I've only ever been able to be myself. And uh, that, that could have either worked out well or gone horribly wrong <laughs> um, but it's just it's it's as it happens um, that has worked for me uh, so do everything you can to always hang on to being your authentic self no matter what anyone else tells you you need to be Kira thank you uh, Prime Minister uh, in my experience um, the greatly undervalued qualities in politics are empathy decency, kindness, and authenticity, and the courage to be authentic and comfortable in your own skin. And you have all those qualities. You have, there are a lot of very, very smart and capable leaders in the world. Uh, you are one of them, but it's those other qualities that make you an exceptional uh, leader in the world and why you've gotten all of our attention. So uh, we look forward to seeing you down the line and hearing from you and your country. And uh, so appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you. 
Ka kite. Thank you, everyone, for having me.